people welcome. You know, this time of year when we're filming all this is springtime and uh, it's just incredible to see the way in which uh, the cadence of life can just really be a sign of things blossoming. And um, being blessed to live in, in Western Pennsylvania, we get to see the four seasons. And I remember living a long time in Rome, a long time in Mexico City, where we only had two seasons. Basically, it was warm and it would get cold and rainy. But you never really got the fullness of spring or the fall. And it's something that I always missed when I was away from the Pittsburgh area. And uh, today, just waking up, seeing the flowers starting to come up, the trees starting to slowly blossom. You can just feel the excitement of spring bringing and being in the air. And it's kind of liturgically right in tune because obviously with Easter coming up as we're in Lent, it's just this great time for us to allow the Lord to really let us grow and to really permit him to love us and to receive his love in our hearts so that we can grow to be the type of people that Jesus wants us to be. And uh, speaking of that, today I have a real blessing to bring on a, an old buddy who I got to meet in the seminary back in 1993. Um, the first time, one of the first memories I have with, uh, uh, with Jonathan, who's going to be coming on, is our families are both numerous. And so our dads thought it'd be kind of funny at the seminary to challenge each other in a soccer game. And they each bet on it. I don't think I knew that there was this other guy well but I think the game ended up a 1-1 tie. And at the end, uh, I asked my dad, what did you guys bet? And they each had a dollar. And they put a dollar like on the goalpost or something like that. And so it was, nobody won. But it was funny. At any rate, it's just great to um, be able to reconnect with somebody who I have uh, just a tremendous amount of uh, respect for and uh, just really admire a lot. Ever since I met him, I think I've spent time with uh, with Jonathan. It's just been a real blessing to, to really re reconnect with things that had uh, brought us together um, back in the day. And um, and I think you'll, you'll notice, at least for me, uh, that one of the things that, uh, that strikes me about Jonathan and just being able to, to share his story is his capacity to listen, uh, listen ultimately to God in his life, to be docile to, to the Lord, but also just as a friend. I can always remember being with him in seminary or the projects we were on. Um, he just was really good at just like listening to others, listening to me, but all the stuff that I would go through and and then just being able to project that out in incredible initiatives that were always bigger than anything I could think of. And um, so it's, I'm just excited to have him on the program today. And uh, he's somebody who obviously has degree universities. He's been an actor. He's done stuff with Mel Gibson. He's consulting in news with Fox News. He's a proud husband, a proud dad. Um, which probably is the things that he's most favorite of. And uh, he also is currently running a leadership um, advisory program with, uh, with uh, James Larson and uh, basically with the full inspiration of trying to inspire people to grow. And so without any further ado, just bring on uh, Jonathan Morris on the program here. Jonathan, welcome to Exploring Catholicism. You know, <laughs> it's Father funny Jim. to think back to that day where we played soccer against uh, your, team, your, your family, but do you, do you remember that? I do. I remember I, I pushing down one of your sisters. Um, exactly. She was very from that. Very <laughs> <physical>. <laughs> <laughs> we were very competitive, and our 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 dads were even more competitive. I think they were. I didn't realize they had bet on it until after the game. I'm like, wow, okay, we almost lost money on this one. That no, we didn't. <laughs> Talk a little bit about your family background. I remember. Um, sharing my life uh, in our seminary together a while. And one of the things about coming from a big family is dinners were always fun. And I think, did you guys do some type of like catechism quiz when you were growing up as you, what were some of the memories you had of just being in a big family? We would, we would always do, um, everything would be a game. So it wasn't as, as holy as it sounds like some of your games were catechism games and things, but ours were um, much more, um, athletic maybe there was always some movement involved so there was my dad would place a a vase in the center of the table and all of us there were se uh, seven of us kids we would stand or sit at equidistant uh, to the vase and we would have little spitballs and we weren't allowed to spit them and that wasn't the idea but it would, you roll up a little piece of paper and toss it in um, and it became very competitive or another favorite was, um, just taking, uh, everybody had 
um, a coin or a ball or something, and it was who would get closest to the wall without touching the wall. Um, very, very simple things. <laughs> um, this was not Xbox or um, or Nintendo or anything like that. Um, this was um, pretty basic games, but it was a great time to be with family. So from the seven of us, um, we all are all are uh, very close to this day. Yeah, and very good athletes too. I remember in the seminary, um, soccer, football, basketball didn't matter. Um, you were able to excel at all of those uh, at all of those sports. That's for sure. Uh, at five foot seven. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it doesn't matter. Moderate competition. <laughs> so now uh, it says that you were born in Cleveland. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you, Jay. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. I, I think you're referring to being a Cleveland Brown fan. Well, uh, that makes it a double reason that I'm so sorry. But <laughs> like, uh, you know, Jesus had that remark where he said, could anything good from? Is that kind of what was he referring to Cleveland biblically, do you think? Or what you was know, I don't want to I don't want to put words in Jesus's mouth, <laughs> um, but I, what I'm very happy about was to learn that, you know, and people might be listening to this three or five years from now and they won't know what I'm talking about, but I don't, I don't mind, you know, the Cleveland Browns had this, this um, excellent quarterback um, named Baker Mayfield the last few years. Excellent, great athlete. And you used to give me a hard time about how mediocre he was. And it turns out now that Cleveland is stepping up its game once, once again, um, and going on to the, new level and um, there's a lot of quarterbacks who want to come to cleveland it looks like we now have a new quarterback it's i hear now that pittsburgh is trying to recruit um baker mayfield and he after spending a lot of time in cleveland feels like it's going to be a very hard thing for him to move to the city of pittsburgh yeah that's all really made up stuff and it's rumors so until anything official happens you're just simply spitting <laughs> but we can conclude that um you know, probably the greatest quarterback of all time had a chance to go wherever he wanted, and he went to Tampa. So I wouldn't say Cleveland is a place <laughs> where all the great quarterbacks would want to go. In fact, they ended up landing on a guy who has, I don't know if it's 22 the last time I talked, allegations against him. So definitely Cleveland attracts a type of quarterback, <laughs> and we won't go into that type right now. It's probably not appropriate to go any further with that. At any rate, uh, Jonathan, talk a little bit about um, – your formation uh, and your experience in the priesthood, especially in terms of what you're doing today to help people grow. I find it fascinating that um, a lot of the work that I got to do with you had to do with the development of youth and uh, young adults. And then you obviously moved in the apostolate area to some of the, the to the more of the media things where we can get to. But talk a little bit about yeah some of the development that, that you did with youth uh, and growing up in, in, in the seminary that we're with. Yeah, well... Um, just to put people in context, um, since I'm not, some people might be wondering, wait, is Jonathan a priest? Is he not a priest? Mm -hmm. He's not wearing a collar right now, but you're talking about the seminary. Um, this is actually my day off. I'm not a Catholic priest, but I was a Catholic priest. And uh, three years ago, I requested dispensation uh, from the Holy Father, from Pope Francis, uh, to leave with the possibility of, of marriage and family. And um, he graciously granted that to me, and um, and my bishop at the time, uh, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, was super, super helpful and gracious um, during that process of discernment, um, giving me um, four months or as long as I needed um, as a sabbatical uh, to think about uh, my decision, and um, ultimately that discernment led to requesting the dispensation. And Cardinal Dolan, although he was sad, um, to see me go, I, I believe, because we were um, we worked closely together, um, and also we were just um, close friends. I'm proud to say, but he was with me all along, um, and he was basically the the exact opposite um, as what I experienced and the first time I discerned, so to speak, about the priesthood, and that was. Uh, with the Legionaries of Christ and um, Father Jay, you uh, you and I were in the seminary of the Legionaries together, and we were um, we ent entered the same year. We were so called, you know, we could say recruited uh, to you know by the Legionaries the same year. You were yeah. Much I, more I would just pause and say that's a really good way to say it. I think the Legionaries uh, discernment program was more of a recruitment program 
trying to fill their coffers with men rather than doing real discernment, which sets the stage for stories like yours, you know? Yeah. And I, I remember going back to um, those first months of the seminary. Um, you had you had been discerning from what I recall. You can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but you had been discerning the priesthood before you even met the legionaries um, or at least before you, you know, entered the seminary, you were thinking about perhaps um, diocesan, uh, diocesan priesthood. And then one thing led to another. We, we both entered the legionaries and um, they, they I'm, I'm sure they've changed some things along the way, uh, but uh, there was certainly no true discernment um, exactly. that was maybe was done by some people individually. And I just wasn't able to do it. I didn't maybe have the the spiritual wherewithal to catch myself and say wait why am i doing what i'm doing is this what god is calling me to um i remember the very first time i met with uh, a priest named father owen kearns um he um i've i've since confronted him about this so this i'm not breaking any secrets here <laughs> he knows what i think but he told me um without knowing me at all um just having witnessed me at on campus at the university, Franciscan University, he said to me, you were created by God from all eternity to be a legionary of Christ. And I, as a uh, 20, 20, 21 year old young man who was trying to follow God's will in my life, uh, was really taken aback by that. And I thought, my gosh, that, you know, this must be a, he must be a prophet. Um, and I should take this very seriously. And I did. And I went to the seminary. Um, I had taken my my roommate, uh, Rhett Young, to, to visit the seminary because he was thinking about being a priest. One thing led to another. Um, I stayed. He went back. He ended up marrying my girlfriend, if you remember the, uh, yep. about this story, Jay. I do. Uh, <clears throat> and then later on, I was ordained with the legionaries. I went, went back and baptized uh, his kids, um, his eight kids. Um, he, he and um, Tasha's kids. So certainly God. Um, Which makes it for me, like, as I think back, because my discernment um, was definitely I was convinced I was called to be a priest. The legionaries helped facilitate that because I couldn't think about being a priest unless I had met people like you and other guys who are in the seminary that were athletic, they were courageous, they were thinking big. And I had always felt that if I was going to be a priest, that that would be part of it. I didn't want to just sit around and talk about theology all day or whatever yeah. the concept of what I thought priest was at that point. Yeah. And just to hear you say that makes it for me even more remarkable about how you gave yourself to the Lord and how you gave him your whole heart in that incredible um, experience that we got to have through a lot of the stuff that y y you did. So it's uh, yeah, it even makes it more incredible and meaningful to me to think that we had that relationship, despite the fact that some prophet from on high told you that this is what you had to do, which is not discernment at all. Yeah. And you, you mentioned in the introduction that you were in inspired by my courage and things. Listen, uh, first of all, I'm inspired by your courage to have a former priest on your show, uh, on, on this podcast, um, that, you know, just, it's very different than, let me just give you, give you another example of the legionaries. And this is not about me bashing the legionaries. Sure. Hopefully, hopefully this will um, help people understand um, elements of, um, of the church and elements of society that um, do not help proper discernment of God's will in your life. Um, but I remember it was such, it was a, such a taboo to have somebody leave the seminary um, because God created us from all eternity to be legionaries of Christ, right? That if somebody were to leave um, and eventually I, I got involved in, with being part of the formation team in, in of the seminary in Rome, I really saw this up, up close somebody were to leave, in other words, discern that they sh shouldn't be there or just said like, I'm out of here, um, or that they wanted to leave, it was done in the middle of the night. You know, it was like when everybody went to bed, lights went out, you know, we would like get this guy out and bring him down to the garage and like drive him out and people would wake up and the guy was gone. And that was so that it wouldn't influence other people to leave. Right? It was all a secret, and it was it was considered a such a a scandal 
for somebody not to do God's will, right? As determined by somebody else, right? Instead of the person. Um, and that is um, obviously not, not healthy. Um, and that's why for me, um, the way I was treated by the church, both by uh, Cardinal Dolan. So I eventually, just to put people in context again, I was a, a, a priest with the Legionaries of, Christ, uh, Legionaries of Christ, ordained in 2002, um, and transferred to the Archdiocese of New York in 2009 um, after um, much of the, the scandal of Father Maciel's life and the fraud, fraud that he um, lived um, and inflicted on a lot of people. Um, so I transferred to the Archdiocese of New York and I was a priest from the Arch in the Archdiocese of New York from 2009 to 2019. So the way in which the um, I was treated by Cardinal Dolan, by the church, by Cardinal Dolan, by Pope Francis, um, was really very healing um, for me in, in many ways. And I'm just so, so grateful to them. But I'm grateful to you that you would have this type of conversation, um, Father Jay, um, that is also still probably uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, I, I had priests who just would never talk to me again after I left the priesthood because they were oh. so scandalized, you know? Um, that wasn't- And I think experience. also it's like, um, well, obviously we were friends and although you couldn't really have friends in the Legion, it was kind of hard to have real relationships, but I think we were able to <laughs> move through that somewhat. But it, it also, for me, it's, it's like, um, what you've tried to do and what you continue to do has been the same thing your whole life is just to be able to listen to the Lord and be able to follow him. And, um, that was, that was probably one of the things that struck me most about when you texted me saying, Hey, I think I'm going to be moving from the priesthood to, 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 um, to the secular, to the lay life. I, it was like, but this has been a kind of a continuation of your life of just trying to, to always try to listen to what the Lord wants and then courageously, um, go after it. Well, that's uh, yeah, before very I get, very Before, terrible. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> I appreciate just, it. <laughs> well, I know your heart, and so a lot of people don't. You're a public figure, so it's not easy to be able to <laughs> to be able to go behind the screens. I guess you could you could say. But I, I guess uh, even before I get back to the question about youth development and kind of where your career is, um, what what's the experience like of being uh, a priest and now to be a married man? How how does God work with you, maybe differently, or how have you seen? Your own development and growth in your faith with Jesus now as a married man, whereas before as a priest. Is there any spiritual insights or yeah. things that you've experienced yeah. in your heart? Yeah, it's um, it's been a, in a an amazing journey. I, I'm I'm very blessed, Jay, that the transition that I made was, although it, it was life altering, gut wrenching, um, heart piercing, all of that, um, and and difficult it was a lot easier than the transition that many people um, who make the same decision um, have to go through just because I was in a different place personally, professionally. Um, I had a great support from my family, hmm. great support, as I mentioned, from my boss, Cardinal Dolan. Um, I had just happened to have done a lot of different things in my priesthood outside of the, outside of the norm of, of parish life or um, I, then you mentioned a few of them, but for the Archdiocese of New York, I was involved in their communications and strategy. I ran a, as program director of the, uh, for Sirius XM, the Catholic channel. I've worked for Fox News for, um, as a contributor for, I think, 18 years now. Um, pretty crazy um, to think about it. Since 2005, um, I've you know, just ended up just having very strange, um, unconventional experiences, let's put it that way, that allowed me to have um, connection with um, with the world and business and entre entrepreneurial things that prepared me to make a, a much easier transition into professional life. Uh, because certainly you have the transition from the spiritual perspective, Jay, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, and that's hard, and I'm still working on that for sure. Uh, but then you have this whole nother aspect of what am I going to do mm. um, uh, personally? So that means dating, um, <laughs> marriage, all of that. <laughs> um, and in my case, having a child now, if if you see, I did not sleep last night at all. <laughs> um, literally, didn't I did not sleep um, because we're trying to, there's something that you, I'm not sure if you know what this is, Dave. It's called ferberizing, something like that, a baby. Which no, is, sorry. What's that mean? 
Yeah, see, exactly. This is the transition. That's <laughs> it's Did we get trained in theology on that. What, what the, maybe I fall asleep that day in class. Letting a baby cry to its itself, his self, uh, herself to sleep. Mm. Um, and so it's sleep training. But um, so I uh, just I'm getting distracted here a little bit. I'm sorry. But the whole professional part is also a, a, a huge challenge, you know, and I've been able to transition in a way I never would have dreamt of. I'm, I now do executive coaching, leadership development. So working with CEOs of companies, um, a lot of startups, fintech companies um, that that are growing very fast. And I work with the CEO and his or her leadership teams to help them lead their organizations in a, um, in a, in a healthier way and a more impactful way uh, through communication, um, through, strategy through understanding like a deep self awareness of what you're good at what you're not good at building teams around you things like that um so it's it's turned out to be such a blessing in all these different areas of my life i love the executive coaching that i'm doing now um and i'm doing a lot of family business work too which is a lot of dysfunction of course uh, yeah. right business is dysfunction and family if you throw family in there family is dysfunction so you like perfect combination, but, um, but then on a personal level, um, I'm now married, you know, I left three years ago, I'm now married with a child and I just got really lucky, um, to have married an awesome woman. And I see God protected me from, um, from making another mistake. I would say, um, my mistake of entering the seminary, God blessed it uh, in many ways, but it was a mistake. Looking back on it, it was a mistake because I didn't, I didn't discern. Um, and so God's blessed me in my personal life so much. And then on, on the spiritual, um, it's hard to sit in the, in the, I am so, when I sit in the back of the church in the pews, people ask me, is that weird for you? Yeah. I'm so happy there. First of all, <laughs> um, I'm so happy because I know that I, especially towards the end, I was just not healthy. Um, I was not in a great, I was not in a good place personally. So I'm relieved not to be up on the altar. Let's put it that way. Um, sometimes it's tough because it's hard to find a good parish, honestly. It's hard to find a good uh, preacher. It's hard to uh, get inspired in a lot of parishes. Um, and we can get into that more if you'd like. Uh, there's a lot of awesome priests like Father Jay and many others that I know. But it's not easy as a lay person to find um, a great parish. What I did was I found a parish that just is a beautiful church. Um, it's a super liberal parish, um, like super liberal, like, um, at the end, we all have to make, um, make a, it's like a, a prom, uh, we all have to reject our white supremacy and our white privilege oh and our, all of this stuff before leaving. Um, but anyway, that's an, a fun story, but I found a church that just architecturally beautiful and I can pray there. Hmm. Um, and so it's things like that, figuring out um, I, um, how to have my relationship with God, conversation with God, uh, without any sense of um, obligation. This is just for me on a personal level, I found health, healthy. If I think, oh, I have to go, this is probably going to scandalize you, Jay, but that's okay. <laughs> that's right. Oh, it's like a, a day of obligation, and it's yeah. going to scandalize life. I'm not going. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. Um, but for me... I know it's in terms of my own health. I'll, I'm sure I will get to a point in which it's like day of obligation. I'm going because I love the fact that the church um, has rules. But right now, I know from my relationship with God, I'm I'm going the extra mile mm. when I feel like this is when I feel or know deep down that this is what God's calling me to do. Whether it's take a half an hour at St. Patrick's Cathedral near my office and and pray. Um, or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I think that the trauma that we went through in the Legion, um, and you can actually see this physiologically and biologically, it can disconnect the balance of the emotional side with the intellectual side of the brain. Mm -hmm. And and thus, um, it's important for us to have healthy relationships and also be able to be um, able to experience those both things and not just be it a CEO priest or just somebody who's doing all these things on one hand, but on the other is disconnected 
And I think uh, our, our mutual background in the legionaries absolutely put us in situations where a lot of the religious life was based on making sure that time is kingdom, you know, like everything is do, do, do. <laughs> free time was five minutes where you could like buff your shoes. That was free time. And so that type of sect atmosphere um, did not develop um, a, a well uh, human beings to be living in a healthy balance between what they feel and what they do. So for me, for example, like this Lent, <laughs> I'm not giving up things. <laughs> I'm like I drove to Cleveland. Although what was a Lenten penance anyway? Because, oh, yes. We, because really? if you look at the painting behind here, there was a Caravaggio there. So I went and see the Caravaggio of St. Andrew uh, getting crucified. So I did go to Cleveland during Lent, which okay. was both a Lenten practice, but also a chance to just like do some self-care, like go enjoy a painting that I oh, like. Why would I have never awesome. done that before? So it's... Uh, so I hear you. And I think for some people, it might be a scandal, but there is this human nature that needs repaired and God so yeah. graciously will allow his grace to be building on that. But it's also, we need to do the self-care in order to put ourselves in a position to- You didn't steal, uh, the, you didn't steal the Caravaggio, did you, Jay? What? Uh, I didn't. That is the call okay. of St. Matthew behind me and the Caravaggio <laughs> at the Cleveland. Have you ever been to the Cleveland Art Museum, Jonathan? Um, a long time ago. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, well, sure well Cleveland kind of stole this artwork. It's kind of official now that, um, so there's this Spanish family that didn't realize they had a Caravaggio with them. And so Cleveland's like, Hey, we'll buy these paintings off of you. And it was for X amount of money. But if the Caravaggio had been known, then it would have been worth probably $50 million. But at any rate, uh, it's up in Cleveland. I was grac grateful for that. Cause that's not too far a drive from Pittsburgh. Yeah. So I appreciate uh, you qualifying that. I didn't want to necessarily delve into it if you weren't comfortable talking about it. So I, oh, I, really... I will. I will answer every question <laughs> in a very honest way. Which <laughs> well, then we let's just jump into something uh, uh, that I've always wanted to ask you about, and that is yeah. uh, Saint John Paul II. At his death, you were able to just be such a spokesperson for the Catholic Church and for for his life, and it was kind of one of the ways that invited you into, I saw the Holy Spirit inviting you into being somebody who could influence public thought with really incredible insights with no preparation at all almost. It was like, here, take a microphone. And there you were just giving these really heartfelt reflections. And I think so many people got to know the faith in the church through, um, yeah, through you speaking on Fox News or all these other news portals. So, I mean, you could probably spend an hour or two just where you could spend a whole lifetime recalling that but as you think back to that, what were some of the things that uh, you're proudest of or that you really enjoyed being able to do or insights into the whole moment of him passing and then you being able to, to just be able to bring that to the world? Um, gosh, I, you know, I didn't realize at the time um, that it was that media would become such a big part of my my ministry and now my even professional life. Um, when when John Paul II died, um, CNN well, all the all the news organizations were looking for uh, people to put on the on the news as you know supposed experts, um, and I had uh, been working uh, before that um, a little bit in advising and kind of media uh, marketing strategy for the the film The Passion of the Christ, as you remember, Jay, um, and so. They were like, oh, we can say Jonathan, Father John, uh, Father Jonathan Morris, um, advisor to, you know, it's Mel Gibson. So they just want, like, basically they want a title um, that makes you an expert. Um, and so I first started working with CNN and then um, Fox, just the way the media works is, it was a real lesson on how the media works. Of course, you know, it's all driven by money and therefore driven, um, you know, by advertiser dollars, but advertiser dollars um, are commiserate with how many people are watching. So I was on CNN for, I think, five days in a row um, with, what was his name? The the old guy. Was, was it Larry uh, King? Larry King. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think it was like five nights a row in a row with Larry King. And so Fox is watching that. And so they tried to poach me to come over to, to Fox. Um, and they said, well, why don't you come over to Fox? And I said, um, well, why should I? And they said, well, we'll pay you more. And I remember telling them, um, they said, how much is CNN paying you? And I said, well, I don't, 
I probably shouldn't tell you if we're negotiating, I probably shouldn't start with telling you how much they're paying. <laughs> and I said, but in the end, it doesn't matter to me the money because um, as a religious priest, I took a vow of poverty. So whatever money would come in, I gave to the, to the order. Right. Right. So I said, you have to come up with something else besides money to motivate me. <laughs> and they said, well, that's all we know. So they just like offered like 10 times what CNN was. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so that was, that was like 15, uh, 15 years, 17 years ago. Um, and, um, now I'm still, I remember the, the day that I left, um, uh, I published that I was going to uh, leave the priesthood or that I was requesting dispensation from the Holy father. I, I knew with absolute certainty that I would never do anything for Fox again. Um, and I, I published it at, um, at 10 in the morning, Eastern, Eastern time. And within an hour, um, the, one of the senior executives at Fox were on the, you know, was on the phone with me saying, just so you know, we want to keep you on as a contributor, as a lay person, um, which was, I saw it only as the act of, you know, of God's providence in my life, um, saying you made the right decision. When I, when I left, I didn't have anybody in mind who I was going to date or marry. Um, I didn't have any idea what I would do professionally. Um, I had no, I was ready for a terrible response from family, friends, um, colleagues, church. That's what I was expecting. Um, and I, I was sure that I would never do anything for Fox again. Uh, but, you know, God has been so good. Um, and that was so in answer to your question about media. I think that's how it's affected my life. Yeah. What do you remember about covering John Paul II? His life was so part of our life as we were growing up in our faith that, uh, you know, that takes you back to there. One of my parishes named St. John of Paul. And it was really St. John Paul the Great, but the problem was he wasn't dead when they built the church, so they couldn't actually uh, name the church after him. But there's JP2 stuff everywhere. Oh, wow. Anything in particular when you think back to that that uh, uh, was worth remembering? Yeah, well, he, of course, he, he was a, his personality was bigger than life. Um, he, he was um, Pope for, what, 25 years. Right. He was the only one that we knew um, as, as Pope, like, that's who we grew up with. And that's the, the Pope when we joined seminary, he was super inspiring, great communicator. Um, and, and the, the legionaries, the founder of the legionaries, Father Maciel had this relationship with him, um, which allowed us, the legionaries to have more access to John Paul II, um, than, than otherwise. Um, I remember, um, bringing a gift. I mean, <laughs> we can get into this. It's so crazy, but yeah. it was bringing a gift from Father Maciel, okay, who was, um, later was um, completely, um, you know, delegitimized by, by the Vatican as he should, as he should have been. But he sent a gift and he asked me to bring this gift to John Paul II on Easter, Easter Sunday. Um, and they told me how to get in. And I went up the ele elevator and I walk out and his secretary, uh, Bishop Jivish was there and he just said, come on in. And he sat me right down at the table with John Paul II. Um, wow. <laughs> at Easter Sunday, there were only like four or five people there and but he, whatever, he, he was very sick at the time. Um, but he communicated well enough to us. And, um, other times John Paul II came to the seminary. You'll remember that Jay, uh, father Jay, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, you remember we got to serve him um, yes. his uh, his Polish cake, and the nun was like a nun not to, you know, she didn't want him to have cake. And so we did this distraction, and you served the Pope the cake, and he was so excited. He just ate the cake and even licked the fork. Yes, exactly. He wasn't supposed to eat that cake because of yeah. his, his health issues. But then John Paul II also brings me mixed feelings, Father yeah, sure. because of, and that's why I brought in Father Maciel. Yep. He, 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 I put Father Maciel on a pedestal and and refused to look into the allegations against him. Um, yep. And I don't think I don't think John Paul II did that with any malice. Um, some people say that it was because of his experience of um, the way in which communists 
um, during, um, during um, Poland's um, Soviet era um, in which you know, they would discredit priests and bishops and say all sorts of bad things, false falsities about them. And so John Paul II knew that this could happen. And for whatever reason, he just decided, well, I'm going to trust because there's such great fruits in the work of the legionaries. There's such, they have so many seminarians, uh, but he did not allow his people to look into the allegations. Um, and so in that sense, I have mixed feelings about John, John Paul, St. John Paul. Um, just mixed feelings. They're mostly, it's mostly feelings, you know. Um, I understand he could live a very holy life, even with this major mistake. Um, but yeah, those are real feelings, right? Like, hey, uh, you're, n you're number two guy over there. Uh, Cardinal Ratzinger tried to show you the truth about fa the allegations against Father Maciel. And he knew the, the truth to them so much that one of the very first things he did once Cardinal uh, Ratzinger became Pope Benedict XVI and succeeded John Paul II, one of the very first things he did was punish Father Maciel and 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 make a public statement uh, that um, that he was guilty um, and and said he should go and live a life of of prayer and penance uh, for the rest of his life um, and John Paul so John Paul II obviously was not listening to Cardinal Ratzinger. Um, maybe people kept him out of it, out of the know, who knows, I'm not sure, but you asked me there, you, you got it. No, I, I agree. And I think um, it sheds lights on something that we, that I pray about a lot. It's just uh, the bishops and cardinals and priests who have used their position. I'm not saying that was the case of John Paul II, but just in general, mm -hmm. um, you think of the McCarrick case and so many cases today of, um, kind of like the prestige and the kind of the honor you could say of the church is more important than justice and personal well-being of our members of our church. And I think when honor is over honesty, that's where so many of these things come as well as um, the plethora of issues that there are found in people who are so many people who are in church leadership. Um, but, but, but for me, I, I go to a, a deeper point of just saying that well, even when Jesus chose the 12, there was a Judas in that 12. And so Jesus can still sanctify us, bring us to heaven and love us and, and work through the Bible, work through the sacred scriptures, work through the, the sacraments, work through so many beautiful means within the church to love us and to save us that um, it's, a, it's a scandal. And it's, it's very hard, especially being a priest, having to, to sometimes see and being mixed in and being a priest as a sinner. Um, to, to do that. And, uh, you know, last week I was on with Father Peter Byrne. And one of the things that he said that St. Patrick, what he used to do is just go walk around with the people. And he didn't like all this kind of like pomp and circumstance. And there's something like that, that I feel like the Lord's allowing our church to do is just to simplify things and, and to, 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 you know, as Pope Francis would say, smell like the sheep. It's like, there's this, there's this sense of just uh, really connecting um, our hearts, minds, and souls in Christ in a community that isn't necessarily based on the fact that this particular position is higher than this position, but that we're all human beings, sinners in need of Jesus Christ's, uh, you know, power. You know what I mean? I, I agree. Just to touch on one point you made um, about when the, when the church focuses on, and I would say not just the church, but yeah, people in general, companies, the NFL, the Browns focusing more on trying to win. And so they hire a guy, 22 allegations. It's like, you know, what's going on here, guys? <laughs> so when when you're seeking the good of the institution over the good of the individual, Amen. Uh, you will always fail eventually. Um, what the legionaries did is they they over and over and over again, it was and they had lots of they had lots of terminology. Um that um, kind of hid the reality of it, but they, they sought the well-being, the growth, the expansion, uh, the prestige of the institution over the individual. Um, and so they, you know, it's not, we weren't, thank God, we weren't abused. Many others right. were, we weren't abused. We had, you know, in many ways, we were given many blessings by the legionaries, opportunities, travel, all sorts of things. But in the end, 
and, and you said it well, Jay, same thing in businesses. And I see this now in my, my new work um, in running this executive um, coaching firm. Uh, when an organization doesn't really care about its people, except for what they can give to the organization, um, in the end, they, they will suffer. Uh, when, when a company takes care of its people, even when it hurts the bottom line in the short term, as it turns out, not only is it good for the people, but it's actually better for the institution. Uh, yeah. Look what happens to the, if look what happens to the legionaries in the end, right? Um, if they had taken care of people and respected their individual dignity, um, their individual liberty, their ability um, to to understand and hear the the Lord's voice, um, things would have gone better for them, and yeah. for the and for the church as, as a whole. Exactly, and it's the same thing on the on the lower level, just on the family level. Uh, it's the same thing. It's like where there's honesty and openness and transparency, where the individual person's dignity is upheld. That's how you can have a family life of of that's fruitful. You know. Yep. So. Um, Talk about what you're up to now in terms of the uh, Morris Larson Advisors uh, um, firm that, you, that you're running. And I think if anybody wants any information, they can find it there. So we grow high impact leaders. I like the word grow. So how do you help a person grow in, in general? And then if you want to go to the high impact people, we'll talk about that. But it's more the growth of people. Like how are you guys able to, what's the secret sauce behind what you're doing to help people grow? Yeah. So the uh, secret sauce, I would say, is helping people to understand themselves, like a deep, deep self-awareness um, and come to play a place of personal security and vulnerability um, in, in their the leadership of their of their team. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, we use um, we use personality assessment tools, one specifically called the Hogan, which is a very scientific um, workplace reputational based um, personality assessment tool, um, which helps people say when I when I'm self-managing um, and the, when I'm self-managing and I'm showing up at the workplace, this is how other people see me when I'm not self-managing um, and I show up at the workplace and I'm having a bad day, I'm tired, I'm anxious. Um, ticked off, um, angry, um, whatever it is, uh, then this is how people see me in the workplace. And this is how, it, that's how, uh, we help people assess, um, how better to, uh, to lead their organizations. So growing is really, it's a very holistic approach. Um, it's mind, body, spirit, if you want to call it that way, in that way, uh, it's really saying, uh, we want you to thrive as a, as a human being, um, at every level. And that means getting to a place in leadership in which uh, you are uh, you are approaching every decision uh, from a high security place. Um, a high security place would be like, I don't care what anybody else thinks. Um, I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm not doing this because I want to kill the competition because I'm, you know, I've got some resentment against that person. Um, that's all low security decision making, right? Um, and high high vulnerability. Uh, leadership is when you can walk into a boardroom and and actually have the humility to um, say what you don't know, listen to other people's perspectives, um, take other people's better ideas when they're better. Um, and so it's it's a it's a growth from the inside out. We also call it inside out coaching. Understand yourself deeply. Who are you? Um, what are your existential values? What are your existential um, goals or projects in life, align those things up with the choices you're making. And what do you find to be one of the hardest points for these high impact leaders to be vulnerable? <laughs> it seems to me that vulnerability would be one of the hardest things a high impact leader could be. It's yeah. Like, you know, man, that's not even my wife knows that about me or my spouse or whatever, right? Yeah. How do you uh, move into well, that area with them? First of all, you get them to pay so that they, so that they so that they have skin in the game. Okay, that's good. Okay, yeah. so in other words, if I were to come and you know you know offer a free seminar for you know right. two days with this executive, whatever, I don't think I would get very far. Um, when when they start paying real money 
and go on a, a year long journey. So we do, we do a, it's a, it's a one year retainer fees is the way um, we work uh, with the companies that we work with. We always start with the top or very close to the top. So we don't go in and do what, what in the industry they call remediation coachings, like, oh, we've got a problem employee, you know, who's an assistant manager for this department. We don't do, we don't do that, although that's worthwhile sometimes. Um, we work with the leadership and we say for a year, let's go on this journey together um, and and get you to a place where you are um, able to lead your organization in a better way. Um, and the, the, the most, the best leaders are ones who say, yeah, I need that. Um, even if they're highly, highly experienced, um, they're so experienced that they know they can get, that they can get better. Um, and if, if they're not sure about it, all they would have to do is ask their employees. <laughs> <laughs> and so eventually that's for another very helpful part. So, it's so, interesting. I know that um, for myself, I've been doing the, that exact thing in my church now. Um, I started about a year ago, uh, just getting some coaching around my own personal growth and spiritual life. And then it's been interesting because what I've realized is how important it is to have that vulnerability and to really rely on the fact that I obviously don't know everything, first of all. <laughs> and then second of all, that I have my own shortcomings, that a team absolutely working together is what's going to be key to us being able to, uh, to be able to open doors for people to get to know Jesus. And understanding that for myself was really hard at the beginning because I'm like, I'm the priest, I'm the like quote unquote pastor here. I got all these years of experience. Yeah. Like what, what are you, Jonathan Morris or James Larson, or in this case, yeah. Scott and Emily, what are you guys going to do? And they're like, well, who's pouring into you? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> just yeah. the Holy spirit. I mean, I got a good prayer life. I got a good thing here, but it was just so enlightening to then have somebody come along my side and be able to help me understand these shortcomings, but then as well, seeing the strengths and yeah. from that, then being able to work together with the team. And we're in a position now where we're merging four parishes in our community and it is, it's gut wrenching. It's exhausting. It's super hard to be able to look at a community and say, after 90 some years, things are changing. And so as a staff yeah. and as a priest group of priests, we feel the ricochet of that. And it's just crazy. So it's so true. It's so enlightening to hear that on a business level, that style of leadership from a vulnerability standpoint is something that's an element to that leadership that you're trying to offer. Yeah. Um, and accountability is another, another aspect to it. You know, it sounds like that's what, that's what you're getting to. If, you know, even if the, even if the coach, even if I'm terrible, <laughs> like even if I have nothing to add um, <laughs> and if somebody goes on a journey and is actually says, these are, this is what I know I want to work on. This is who I am. And I'm going to start really making some choices and I want you to hold me accountable to it. Um, you know, even if I just kind of walk in and say, Hey, you said you wanted to do this, this, and this last week, have you done it? Like that's super valuable, right? Yeah. And so executives um, or leaders um, of organizations who, who do that get a lot out of it just from that aspect of it, if they take it seriously. Yeah. There's a book I read about the seven desires uh, by Mark Laser, And one of those desires is just to be heard. And there's no doubt that like, what I said at the beginning, it doesn't make so much sense that you're in this area because I wonder how many of the those leaders really have somebody who's just listening to them, not like mm -hmm. tell me what to do, but like, who are you? And what are some of those interior things that are going through your heart as you're making these things yeah. happen? Yep. So it's almost like, yeah, you're a coach, but you got a stethoscope. You're like, you're listening for deeper things than just like what's going on on the outside. You know, that's exactly right. Love it. Yeah. I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna use that example. <laughs> what example? The stuff. <laughs> I'm sure, you can use any example you want. There, that's that's all good. We have a couple minutes left, um, and I, I'm gonna circle back to something that um, we mentioned a little bit in the beginning. But I'm just really fascinated by my favorite movie of all time is definitely Braveheart, and uh, Steve okay. McAvity was one of the producers who just became a great friend, somebody who I got to get to know um, uh, through uh, you introducing me to Mel Gibson with the Passion of Christ and. And Jim Caviezel, those two guys are just incredible guys in, in an area of work like Hollywood. And they just, they're just really upstanding guys. I've just always yeah. enjoyed them. But um, I remember when I got to sit at the set, because you brought me in to get to see Mel Gibson do the uh, the Passion of Christ. And 
it was crazy because my favorite artist is Caravaggio and I'm sitting next to him as he's doing the whole scene with, with, uh, with the, the lot, um, at the garden of Gethsemane. And he looks at me, he goes, I hope this can be a moving Caravaggio. Um, Mel Gibson has so many facets to his life. How would you describe Mel Gibson and his ability to be able to put Jesus, the passion of Christ in such an incredible film? Hmm. Um, you know, your work with that, but the, I don't know, what insights do you see that you remember from him? Yeah, well, he's a he's a complicated person, as you know, um, Father Jay. You know, so um, I'm not going to try to make him into a, a saint here. Oh um, no, yeah. But he, what he did do, is he listened to the voice of God. I have every reason to believe it was the voice of God in order to make this film. So here, uh, he, I remember him telling me the story of when he was uh, making. It was really when he was making the film. What women want. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's like on a, I think I, I watched it at yeah. least once on an airplane. Exactly. Uh, and you know, so he, it's it's a you know it's a it's a comedic film um, and uh, kind of fun and um, very superficial. But as he was making that film, he had this this like deep deep existential movement going on saying you have to make the film the passion you have to put into film this the story of um, the suffering and death of our lord jesus christ and he had written he had um, read some um, some writings of some catholic mystics that had kind of put um into his mind and to his imagination what the what the passion must what Jesus's passion must have been like. And so that those creative juices started flowing and he went and he did it and he did it um, um, under a lot of stress. Um, he used most of his own money, which he was very glad that he did later <laughs> because it was such a hit. Um, but, but then he also had meltdowns afterwards. If you remember uh, his, um, his racist anti-Semitic, drunken rants you know he had demons for sure he yeah. used to talk, i remember him saying no i'm not anti-semitic or at least i wasn't anti-semitic before the jews started pouncing on me for making a supposedly anti-semitic film which is not anti-semitic but they're making me anti-semitic <laughs> <laughs> that's the only he could do you know um uh so uh, but he was a he he definitely had the fear of the lord in him he really um was concerned about pleasing God. Um, and I think that will ultimately serve him well. Um, I, I don't have any contact with him now. I actually just wrote an email to, to uh, Jim Caviezel yesterday. That's funny that you brought it up. Um, and it, Jim actually, when I, when I left, I was sure that Jim would like um, <laughs> disown me for life just because he's a very <laughs> intense person and very yeah. conservative Catholic. He, that same day that I made the, um, announcement he wrote and um said i'm with you i remember him when you were by my bedside in the hospital and when i had my surgery i will be carrie and i his wife will be there for you um really beautiful um wow. yeah the the um one of the mediums of which mel gibson uh obviously communicates is through the violence and the blood and i know i remember him talking about that like he didn't even show all of the the suffering that Jesus had. He couldn't, obviously, the, the pain and the suffering of that. But um, I don't know. Before we finish, what do you see in that movie in terms of maybe it's the scourging, maybe it's the crucifixion? Is there something that you remember from that that really helped you uh, maybe identify more with the suffering of Jesus, how much he truly loves us? Because I felt like yeah. one of the strengths of Mel Gibson, whether it be Braveheart or so many of these movies, uh, not the girly flicks, but the, <laughs> the, the the ones that were like where we, when we were soldiers and that stuff like that, that he uses uh, the violence, the blood as a, as a medium to communicate a message similar to what obviously what Caravaggio does when Caravaggio actually has these paintings of the, the beheading of St. John the Baptist. And they're just very graphic, uh, violent scenes, but he uses violence to bring people yeah. into, it really takes barriers down. It makes you just very vulnerable in front of what's going on. Uh, what immediately comes to my, my mind is the scene of Barabbas mm. right there um, in the Praetorium 
um, in which Pontius Pilate comes out and says, who do you want, Jesus or Barabbas? We, we, we pray this um, together every, um, every tritium, every Holy Week, right, when we go through the Passion. And, you know, the people are shouting, we want Barabbas, we want Barabbas. And Barabbas, as Mel Gibson depicted him, was a, a gnarly, um, just kind of horrific person, you know, uncapped, um, dirty, uh, like his hair was all mangled. Um, he was like, like foaming from the mouth, yeah. just from anger. And um, he hated the very people who were trying to set him free. And I remember Jim Caviezel was getting ready to, he did, he did two or three takes on it and Mel was not happy. And I was standing next to, to Jim Caviezel and he said, well, what do you think? He was, Jim was really praying um, and he had the Eucharist actually on him. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for this scene in particular, I believe. And he said to he said to me, what do you think, what do you think Jesus would have, would be thinking or, you know, going through mm -hmm. um, at this moment? of his passion. And, and I, I said, or he said, I don't remember exactly how, what the conversation was. It was probably Jim's idea. Um, but we came to the conclusion that he probably would have been concerned about Barabbas's soul hmm. more than his own freedom, right? Because that's, he was actually uh, becoming a slave for us. Uh, to be freed, right? And he was here, Barabbas was not accepting um, the love of Christ uh, for him. And so that in the next take, Jim focused on Barabbas and caught his eye. And that actor um, was, it turns out that he was an atheist and he was wow. pissed off because he was a relatively famous actor in Italy and Mel, Mel Gibson was having him do a role that where there was not even a single line, he, right? He didn't say anything. Um, he was, um, and he was offended by that professionally. How could you have me on this movie and not even give me a line? Um, and it turns out when he's, he writes that when Jim Caviezel connected eyes with him, on, on that in that scene, not only was it a super powerful scene, but he had a conversion in his own life. Mm. Um, and so I think that that is one of uh, the, the biggest memories for me. Isn't that true, though, right? Like to look into the eyes of our Lord, despite if we're like Barabbas, <laughs> is going to be our only means of salvation. Yeah. It's like I feel like Barabbas all the time, so short seating so many things. And it's like, we just need that look at Jesus, especially in just Eucharistic adoration of just being able to look into the to the incredible presence of Jesus and allow that to to, to do that. One of the things for me that I always remember is um, Jim Caviezel talking about the Last Supper scene that he had to film, and it was very hard for him. And then they set up the uh, the Blessed Sacrament behind the camera so he could look at the Blessed Sacrament. And he was like, "If my eyes weren't Eucharized, I couldn't have done that." And it was yeah. like. That's it. That's what we can connect in such a deep yeah. personal way with is Jesus who sacrificed himself so present to us. Um, yeah. Hey, Jay, did, did, your, did, your, did your dad come up with the name uh, for exploring Catholicism? <laughs> so he did not come up with it. That was wow. um, the great producers I have behind the screen here, Lee and okay. Angie. I can't remember which one of them did this. Probably Lee. Uh, but I uh, wouldn't want to give credit to uh, without that. Uh, but that's funny see. that you would think about my dad. He definitely is really good with words. He's you know yes. just a tremendous, uh, yeah, speaker and all that. But uh, no, I don't think he had. He's been on the program though. We had a fun okay. time with him um, about a I year just, or so. Ago. I could just picture he like he he loves that type of conversation. Let's <laughs> what, what would we name it? What are we gonna? What's the you know like it's the marketing of it? It's the you know how are we going to tap into um, the essence of this program? And uh, yeah, there's just me that I just show up and just try to create a conversation. Like I yeah I personally love this because I get to hear. Um, oh, I've had so many amazing conversations with different people. Mm. I, I can't remember awesome. her name right now, but she was an 80 year old lady, just a fascinating theologian. And she grew up in like Brooklyn and she starts off by saying to me, <laughs> she goes, 
She's like, yeah, I'm a, I, I grew up an atheist Jew. And I was like, what, wait, what do you mean you're atheist Jew? She's like, yeah, Jewish is just a cultural thing. We didn't believe in God, though. That wasn't yeah. definitely something. And I go, well, okay, well, what would have been like to be you when you were like born or growing up in your family? And she goes, oh, my mom was at an orgy and I got, and she got pregnant with me. And then some guy said, oh, well, don't, don't, uh, don't get rid of the baby because people like grow the baby like a pet. I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God! And then she turns out to be this tremendous theologian. It just, it's just so many deep insights. She converted and wow. obviously fell in love with saints like Saint Edith Stein, and you know, incredible. So, uh, just yeah, it's 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 a blessing, and I, I can't appreciate enough uh, for you coming on. We'll definitely have to get to a Brown Steelers game at some point, and um, I don't know Let's what that's going to be like though. It definitely be a could be a real tough thing. So, but uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. I think we can handle that. Um, I, next week, just cool. for our, our, our audience, uh, we have uh, Lauren Galt coming on. She is a consecrated woman who um, lives her consecration just basically as a personal consecration to Jesus. She's not a part of any order, but she's just a beautiful woman who's here in Pittsburgh who just gives her life to Jesus. Consecration has to do with everything of setting yourself aside for Jesus. And so she's going to come and talk to us about what it's like to be a consecrated woman. Um, in today's world and in the church and how she sees that great relationship with Jesus, almost like her being the spouse. And so it's so beautiful to be able to have her come on and, and talk about uh, such a, a deep part of our Catholic tradition and uh, looking forward to that. Jonathan, I appreciate you coming on today. Uh, Thanks, <laughs> I want you Jake. to make sure that you get your sleep though. I mean, as a dad yeah. there, you got to make sure you're sleeping right. And that whole oh, thing my. on getting your baby to cry and not getting back to sleep. Gosh, I hope that, how long is that supposed to last? Oh, geez. I mean, it is bad. Um, last night was the first night, but um, it's they can say it goes like a week or two weeks or three weeks, but we haven't slept in. Uh, uh, Andrew is our son. He's six months. He's almost six months. He just doesn't like to sleep. He likes to get up and eat every hour and a half. Um, so, but you know what? I, I know I'm in the right place. I was thinking about this yesterday because unlike when I was in the priesthood, because I did not discern well, um, I know that the, that I would never change this. Hmm. If, even if I could, you know, like if I could just snap my fingers and oh, I'll start something, I would never do it ever. Right. Whereas when I was in the wrong place, if someone said, God's not going to be a, upset at you and you're not going to let anybody down, I would have left in a second. Yeah, and I think uh, that's a good way to end. They're just like, there's you, you can't have love unless there's freedom. And when God created us, he, he gave us that freedom. And it's yeah. really being able to harness the capacity that he's blessed us with and be able to offer that to the Lord to let him lead us in his love. And um, yeah, thanks again, Jonathan. It's great to, great to see you. Thanks, I, um, Jay, tell all your family that I said hello. I and will. I, so I love your priesthood so much. And I love the work that you're doing so much. And I love you as a friend so much. You too. I love you too, Jonathan. God bless you. Thanks, buddy.